Good morning, everyone. Uh, we come to chapter 24 of Acts, and uh, this is Paul as he goes before Felix at Caesarea, the coastal town. Um, and he has been taken there from Jerusalem, as we saw last week, guarded by 470 Roman soldiers. Uh, the Lord is protecting him from the assassins that had uh, planned to get him on the, uh, in the midst of transit. Um, so we've seen the Lord work in his life, and now he gets him to Caesarea before Felix. And the story of Felix is really uh, a story of spiritual procrastination. Uh, which is a terrible thing. Uh, the Lord says today is the day of salvation. Um, and when you hear the, the, the voice of the Lord, you are to believe at that time. Um, but we see that there are influences in this world that draw people away from the gospel, cloud their view. Um, Satan works in, in many ways to um, keep us from a hearing, a clear, hearing clearly the voice of the Lord. Uh, and I think that's what happens here in Felix's procrastination. So let's pray and then we'll get going. Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful for your word, uh, grateful for what we see here. Pray that you would show us uh, by the power of your Holy Spirit what it is we are to know and how we are to live. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. So here we have Paul going before Governor Felix and uh, apparently, as, as I said in the introduction, apparently uh, his conscience is being um, tweaked, is, is being uh, moved, and there are other forces, as we will see, that are trying to suppress his conscience as he moves, uh, as he hears the gospel. So Paul has uh, more or less defended himself previously before a Jewish crowd at the temple, Acts chapter 22, and then the more formal hearing with the Sanhedrin, Acts chapter 23. And now he's taken from Jerusalem because of that plot and, and the, uh, the Jewish assassin, assassins who were going to kill him. Moved to Caesarea uh, with the, the vast majority of troops that were stationed in Jerusalem for his protection. And now is the trial proper, so to speak, uh, of Paul and what he has been charged with. And it is before uh, the governor, whose name is Felix. Uh, and here we learn that the Sanhedrin have brought, uh, have taken a uh, lawyer. And in today's world, we call him high power lawyer. Uh, he is um, uh, well known. He has, uh, has these killer instincts, so to speak, as far as a lawyer goes. And they bring him to represent their side. Now, why would they do that? Uh, a man whose name is Tertullus. Um, well, perhaps they view their case as particularly weak, uh, and they want somebody to argue uh, well their case. Uh, I can remember one professor at seminary saying, well, when your point is weak, just pound on the pulpit. Uh, if your point is biblical, it, it's, all, it's never weak, okay? So what they do after five days, they arrive there. And let me begin reading in verse, uh, chapter 24, verse 1. And after five days, the high priest Ananias came down with some elders and a spokesman, one Tertullus. They laid before the governor their case against Paul. And when he had summoned Tertullus, began accusing him, saying, Since... Through you we enjoy much peace. Now he's saying this to Felix. Now you can see the uh, the um, uh, the uh, what's what's the word I want? The like the icing on the cake. He's really laying it on here for the governor, because remember, as we saw last week, the governor Felix was at one point a slave. Um, so that is the lowest of the low, and now he's governor of this area. Um, so he's probably a coarse man, um, and we'll see in a moment he was known basically as, as the hanging judge. When uh, people were brought before him, uh, he was quick to give them the death penalty. Uh, perhaps this was uh, bitterness from his days as a slave, we just don't know. But the lawyer from Jerusalem, uh, who is Roman, but he's also got sort of a Jewish name, 
perhaps covering both bases for the Sanhedrin, he lays it on a little thick here. Verse uh, 2, since through you we enjoy much peace, and since by your foresight, most excellent Felix, reforms are being made for this nation, in every way and everywhere we accept this with all gratitude. But to detain you no further, I beg you in your kindness to hear us briefly. For we have found this man a plague. One, he's referring to Paul. We have found this man a plague, one who stirs up riots among all the Jews throughout the world and is a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. Now remember, um, Nazarenes was a really a negative term. Uh, it was derisive. Um, that was the wrong side of the tracks. Remember, Jesus is, even though he was born in Bethlehem, is never talked about as the Bethlehemite, Bethlehemite but always as the Nazarene. Um, and this was one of the fulfillments of the prophecies concerning Jesus, that he would come out of Nazareth, would be called a Nazarene, would be, uh, his name would be derided, he would be seen of, uh, by the majority of the world as somebody not to associate with. Of course, the prophet Isaiah says, um, his face had no beauty, we, we turned away from it. Uh, that would be all part of that prophecy from the end of the second chapter of Matthew uh, concerning where Jesus would be come, come from out of Nazareth. So from the sect of the Nazarenes, and that would be the way or Christianity. Verse 6, he even tried to profane the temple, but we seized him. By examining him yourself, you will be able to find out from him about everything of which we accuse him. So uh, here are basically the three charges that are brought against Paul. First, that Paul's a menace, a political menace, uh, that he was a plague who had stirred up trouble, uh, caused civil unrest everywhere he went. Now we see where he has gone. There is what a revival or a riot, and sometimes there is both. And then you have the Judaizers who followed him from city to city right on his tails um, to stir up trouble after he has preached the gospel. And according to uh, Tertullus, it's not just in Jerusalem, but it's in the entire world. Paul has stirred up trouble in the entire world. Well, if there is trouble, there's, it's trouble because of the gospel that has gone. And it's not trouble, it is simply a change, and we would understand it a change of, of graciousness. Um, so that's the first charge. The second charge is that he's a religious heretic. Uh, well, he, he no longer is within the Jewish world. Uh, he is basically in the fulfillment of the Jewish world uh, in, in being a Christian. But not only has he disturbed the peace of Rome, the uh, Pax Romana, uh, which was a classic of that. Everybody, you had to maintain the peace of Rome or Rome would come and crush you. Uh, that's just the way that it worked in that time period. But he was also a leader of a sect of the Nazarenes, and that lay outside of the special privileges and special protections that Rome had extended to the Jews. You could worship as a Jew, <coughs> excuse me, and live your life as a Jew under Roman authority as long as you didn't stir up any trouble. Uh, but Christianity was now seen as different than Judaism, and they were risking not having those same protections. And as we will see shortly, um, once we hit into the, the 80s, 60, 62, 63, 64, and the rise of Nero uh, in particular, uh, he had to have somebody to blame, so he blames the Christians. And then the, a few emperors later, you see a vast persecution of believers. And, and that goes on, off and on, uh, really up until uh, 300, 340, et cetera, uh, when suddenly Christianity is given some protections um, under the Roman Empire, emperor at that time. So Paul was not there really a political menace, but he was a heretic according to the Jewish definition and that put him outside of, of that protection. Um, 
but a, a, a heretic uh, also carried some punishment under Roman law and authority. And of course, the third uh, uh, accusation that he had desecrated the temple. Um, verse six, he even tried to profane the temple, but we seized him. We stopped him just in time. Well, we've seen this uh, previously that Luke has debunked this. He never did take um, a Trophimus, a Gentile, into the court of Israel. Um, uh, that was a, a false accusation just made by um, some Jews in that area in an effort to attack Paul and to uh, eventually uh, be his death. So Felix, as, as far as we can tell here, let me read verse 9. The Jews also joined the charge, affirming that all these things were true as well. And when the governor had nodded to him, Paul got a chance to speak. Now what happens in a basic trial here is the defense speaks, the uh, accused speaks, and then judgment is given. Um, there's no back and forth. There's no uh, interrogation either way. You just have one side, then the other, and then the uh, judgment. We don't believe that uh, Felix is all that impressed um, because especially with that last portion uh, of verse 6, the profane the temple, because he's already read the letter that was sent to him. Uh, so he understands what already has happened. So I'm thinking in Felix's mind he has kind of uh, discarded the third charge and is only really looking at the first two. So the, the accusations have been given, and now it is time for Paul's defense. And Paul basically says, I'm glad to defend myself. Verse 10, uh, knowing that for many years you have been a judge over this nation, and as I said, he was known as the hanging judge. Uh, that would be our term. Uh, there was, uh, that's, I don't know what the exact term would be there, but that's what we would say, the hanging judge. I cheerfully make my defense. You can verify that it is not more than 12 days since I went up to worship in Jerusalem and they did not find me disputing with anyone stirring up a crowd either in the temple or in the synagogues or in the city. The whole world has been this and, and Paul says I did this all in 12 days. Uh, so it's kind of a stretch, kind of a stretch here um, that he would think the whole world could be in flux just because of the last few days. Um, now, he is giving them, yes, uh, I have been here, um, but you can't really say that I destroyed anything, that I, I stirred up the world. Verse 13, neither can they prove to you that they now bring up against me. But this I confess to you. Now, Paul is admitting in his defense to something in particular, but of course he is admitting things that are appropriate to the gospel of Christ. But this I confess to you. That according to the way, that would be Christianity, which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets. So he's saying, I'm, I believe what you believe. You just are not making the move to Christ. Having a hope in God, which these men themselves accept, that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. So I always take pains to have a clear conscience toward both God and man. Now, after several years, I came to bring alms to my nation and to present offerings. Well, I was doing this. They found me purified in the temple without any crowd or tumult. Now, that's, that deals with Paul's purification rite uh, that James suggested he do with the four uh, men who would take the Nazarite vow and then the accusation of uh, having a Gentile Trophimus in the temple. He said, I was doing that, but I wasn't anywhere I shouldn't have been. But some Jews from Asia, that would be those from Ephesus that followed him, they ought to be here before you and to make an accusation, should they have anything against me. Uh, or else let these men themselves say what wrongdoing they found when I stood before the council. Other than this one thing that I cried out while standing among them, it is with respect to the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you this day. So this is what it boils down to. In Paul's defense, he's doing what? He's preaching the gospel. He's preaching the resurrection of Christ. Um, and so, uh, you know, what uh, he's talking about 
um, all of these things that, that go on and, um, you, you know, that, that this is really what is important. It is the things of Christ. It is the power of Christ. It is the resurrection of Christ. And just kind of as an aside, about 150 years from this time, uh, one of the early church fathers, Tertullian, is going to be on trial for something. And he's going to basically use the, the words that Paul uses in his defense. Um, because uh, it, it, uh, the accusations are that Christianity has become a menace to society. It's, it's this sect that needs to be wiped out. And what he is saying... What Paul is saying here and what Tertullian reiterates is if you want to find a good citizen, you'll find them in the church. Because that's part of being a Christian. As Paul writes towards the end of Romans, um, that we're to obey the civil magistrates as long as they don't go against the word of God. When they vary from God's word, then we are free to disobey, disobey, but there might be civil punishment involved in that disobedience. So we have to be ready for that, but we should gladly accept it knowing that we have obeyed God rather than men. So if you want to find a good citizen, look in church. That's basically, that's what he's saying. Uh, so Paul mentions, in, in, and let's read a little bit more, um, uh, Jesus Christ and the resurrection from the dead. And then in verse 25, as he reasoned about righteousness and self-control, um, he's preaching the Christian life again. Uh, it seems to be all that Paul does when he's being accused. He preaches Christ. So let me read verse 22. But Felix, having a rather accurate knowledge of the way, put them off, saying, When Lysias, the tribune, comes down, I will decide your case. So this is the first time that Felix kind of puts off Paul. And say, I'm going to put you on hold for a little bit. Um, I've heard this. I'm pretty familiar with the way. That's Christianity. Uh, but I'm going to put you on hold. Then he gave orders to the centurion that Paul should be kept in custody, but have some liberty and that none of his friends should be prevented from attending to his needs. So it's probably um, the church of Caesarea, at least the, the, the companions that were traveling with Paul, the, um, the seven or eight who aren't with him at this time, uh, came and, and cared for him, probably brought special foods, spent time in prayer. Paul was probably teaching them, encouraging them as well during these times. Um, so let's look at the outcome here. He wants to wait for Lysias to come. Verse 24, after some days, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish. Now, she's mentioned here, and we have to look and, and dig a little bit about why she might be mentioned here and why it's important uh, that we see who she is um, and, and what, what place she is, what part she's playing in this whole drama here. Well, Felix is married to, to Drusilla. Um, she was the granddaughter of Herod the Great, daughter of Herod Agrippa I, now, that's the Herod who died in the awful way back in Acts chapter 12. When Felix first saw her, now, we're, 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 from history, we're thinking she's about 22 at this point okay, in, in, in her life when she sees Paul. Felix saw her and was really taken by her beauty um, and just decided he had to have her as a wife. The problem was she was married to somebody and he was married to somebody. But uh, when you have a certain amount of power, those things, uh, we can't let those little things stand in the way here, much like uh, shades of John the Baptist and, and all those things. So uh, what we find in history is that uh, Felix had a, a Jewish friend who was some sort of a magi magician. Um, and he goes as his... Um, man, so to speak, to talk to Drusilla. And he eventually convinces Drusilla to leave her husband and come and marry Felix. Now, it's not told what Felix did with his wife, uh, whether he killed her or divorced her or whatever, but um, 
so that they, he says, you will not be mistreated. You will be held in the highest esteem. He goes on and on all these flowery uh, terms. And she does. And she leaves her husband and goes and lives with Felix. Now, this was unwise because we see in verse 24, she was Jewish. Now, now the Herodians were Edomites, um, so they come from Edom, but the, they were also kind of half Jewish. So she has these Jewish roots in her, and that means that she is in big trouble within her religion. Um, she knew she wasn't supposed to do this. Uh, Felix knew that this was wrong, but he could not control his urges and his desires. Uh, so, yes, she eventually comes, even though it's against the religious rules, and is with Felix. So, as I said, she's about 22 at this time. Uh, in chapter 24, um, um, as I said, she comes back with Drusilla um, to see Paul again. She is Jewish. Uh, no other information, all this information is coming back from historic uh, uh, evidences, Josephus, the historian. In fact, he states that they had uh, a son and a daughter. The son was named uh, Agrippa after her uh, father, and the daughter's name was Clementina. Uh, and one or all of them died at Pompeii. I mean, that's what Josephus says uh, after the volcano erupted and buried Pompeii in ash. Um, so they came to a bad end. So Felix, verse 25, calls Paul back and heard him speak about faith in Jesus Christ. Now, this isn't to hear more information about the trial. Felix says, come and tell me about Jesus Christ, even though he has accurate knowledge of the way already. Verse 25, and as he reasoned about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment... Felix was alarmed. Now, remember what I just said about Drusilla and Felix pursuing her, even though she was married and he was married. And what does Paul do? He gets right in the face of Felix with a discussion about righteousness, self-control, which Felix obviously wasn't exercising, nor was Drusilla, and the coming judgment. Well, Felix was alarmed. I, I bet he was alarmed. And he says, go away for the present. When I get an opportunity, I will summon you. Now, I, I think this was probably a much longer exchange uh, and more in detail than what, what Luke gives us here. But he gives us the high notes, righteousness, self-control, the coming judgment. And the, the King James Version is really uh, interesting here. Uh, he sends Paul away until some more convenient season some more convenient season well had his chance you know <laughs> had his chance um, verse 26 at the same time he hoped that money would be given him by Paul so he sent for him often and conversed with him basically over the next two years he went back and forth with Paul uh, always remember he was a slave at one time so, you know, maybe he was greedy, maybe he was concerned about day-to-day -day expenses, even though he was the governor, and looking out to get more and more and more. He was never going to get any money out of Paul or out of the church. So he kept him there just in case, and, but he talked with him over time. I'm going to make an assumption here that Drusilla was an influence in Felix's continuation of putting Paul off, putting faith off. Maybe her conscience was the guiltier conscience uh, in all of this, and she influenced Felix in this. So verse 27, when two years had elapsed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus, and desiring to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. So for us today, I mean, when you when the Spirit moves in your life, you better act. And if you're a believer already, when, when the Lord is tugging on you for something, you, you better follow that. You better seek out and see if that's really what the Lord wants. Seek out wise counsel, faithful counsel. Dig into the Word. Is this something that the Lord would be pleased with for me to do? If He's pulling at you, 
the Spirit's moving in your life, then, then you better act. You better not put it off. Uh, don't be a procrastinator when it comes to spiritual things. Um, uh, use what the Lord has given you. Put it to use and put it to use now. Well, after two years, they, Paul never really, I guess, finished um, with Felix. Felix left. And Festus is, is the new governor. Um, and Felix has basically, after histor- history says, after uh, some local disruptions and hostilities, uh, that's why he is replaced with Festus, because he didn't handle them in the right way, and, and Rome wasn't pleased. Um, so uh, now remember, Ro- Paul is a Roman citizen, and it is his right uh, when on trial to appeal to Caesar. That was the right of every Roman citizen. And as we see in chapter 25, that's what Paul's going to do. He's going to appeal to Caesar because Caesar lives in Rome. And that's where Paul is going. So we'll see you next week.